here with John Corey, lifelong missionary. John, you grew up in a in a home with ten children in Port Angeles, uh, Washington, and I'm sure you had to learn a servant's heart very early on. And and uh, with all those children, with the place you had, had to be very resourceful as well. My dad, when uh, I was about six, was able to get something like 20, 22 acres. And because he did not have a regular job, he was a rural type missionary traveling around much in the western part of the U.S. as well as in the community working with um, prison and in, into uh, old folks homes and counseling people and just meeting people and their needs and in the community helped get the church started that was there locally. Um, he didn't have a regular support base. He, he had no organization behind him. So all the years I grew up, he had no regular paycheck. And he was a real man of faith. But on this place, we grew almost everything we ate. We had some cows, we had chickens. We grew all the garden things that we needed to, and picked wild berries up in the hills. And so, yeah, we were, we were working. <laughs> we had to really work uh, diligently often <laughs> as a family. Well, I, I also understand that uh, six of the ten children became missionaries. I don't know whether full-time or not, but six of ten, that's uh, pretty incredible. My mom and dad had a real heart for missions. And uh, I one time heard my mom say to my older sister, she came back from Bible college, I always prayed that one of my children would be a missionary to Africa. Mm. Um, missions, missionaries were our heroes. They were my heroes. They have them in the home. I would listen to their stories. And by about the fourth grade, I was really looking into missions as, as a life occupation. And when I was about 12, I remember my folks took me to a, a meeting that was in uh, community center and uh, the pastor spoke on or the speaker spoke on um, Romans 12 1 and 2 and I know that deeply impacted me that time and, and in a way I really was seeking to surrender my life to God at that time and in our family 8 out of 10 of us actually went up to Prairie Bible Institute up in Three Hills, Alberta, Canada. Another spent a year in Columbia Bible College. So out of our family, almost everybody had been at least for some period of time okay. away in school like that. And out of that, there was this whole current of <laughs> God leading us into missions. You, you said that obviously the speaker and him preaching from Romans 12 specifically had greatly impacted you. What about any, any individuals, any, any specific people that, that you would just want to say really God used Well, my life? dad, my dad was authentic. Mm -hmm. I can never look back at one time when he would, I would say he was unreal or counterfeit. One of the illustrations was I had a terrible temper as a kid. And I got in fights, and people say something, and I just blow up, and I had no control. I went, he took me many times to the woodshed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there were a couple times when we'd sit down at the supper meal, he'd say, John, what you did was wrong. My discipline of you was right, but I didn't have control of my spirit. Will you forgive me? I wanted to feel like I wanted to climb under the table. Right. I was so embarrassed or so humiliated that my dad, when I was did wrong, would now ask for forgiveness from me. And I also found that example to be a tremendous help to me when I was raising my own kids, to be willing to admit when I was <laughs> wrong. Sir. And and uh, um, my mom, as I already mentioned. She 
with a busy lady. Traveled with dad some, but when she's back home, all the farm and all the things in the place, just going from day to night, she was always singing. <laughs> and I would hear her say, I remember when the wall was going up in Berlin and people were fleeing across into Berlin and she was just heard about it and she would, was so concerned for these people leaving everything. And when she heard the news, her response was, oh Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she's back to her business, back to her singing. She could take a burden, cast it on the Lord and go back about joyfully serving. Mm -hmm. Tremendous example to me. Certainly. The third example is, is my wife. I, we grew up pretty competitive as kids and we really didn't know how to encourage one another or to uh, to praise one another or to we were always kind of pushing the other guy we didn't want to make anybody proud you know <laughs> and um, I carried a lot of that background into my marriage and my wife's family were very close-knit and we had kind of the war of the sexes in the family and now I get married and we get into an argument and my wife starts crying. Jeanette starts crying. And I don't know what to do with a crying woman. <laughs> I walk in, the, we were in, down at Biola and Hope Street in California, and I walked down the hall in this 12 by 12 room where we lived, down the hall and down the other hall to get to the bathroom and wait till I calm down and get things right, then come back and apologize. But she became a molder of me in so many ways. One other example of that was when I was in Ethiopia and we were playing volleyball with a lot of missionaries and I dove down and got the ball up and just when I, I get it up and the woman puts out her hand like this and it goes off the fingertips. I said, couldn't you at least reach over and hit it? And Jeanette told me afterwards, she said, you know, we kind of had a discussion <laughs> about this and I couldn't figure out why she would want to play if she didn't want to win, if she didn't want to work at right. it. She said, they just, enjoy playing in the ball game. I said, well, why don't she at least try some? She said, John, this game will soon be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But what you said to her will not be forgotten. Mm -hmm. That's good. She's more important than the game. That's good. And it's the only game I ever remember. <laughs> 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 but the truth I learned from that, even though at the time I didn't give in to her really, but it really sunk deep in me mm -hmm. that I need to be a builder of people more than a competitive spirit. And, and I would say that's happened many times in our life. So three people have been very key in developing who I am. Oh, that's huge. Spending time with you in the States and internationally, I can see the, the humility from your father. I know you don't want to hear these things, but the joy of your mother and the, the compassion of your wife. Thank you. And, just as you, as you were growing up under your mother and father with these nine siblings, and and obviously there, you you on this place taking care of this place. What what would you say are some of the things that you learned? Maybe skill sets or other things that you really took to the mission field with you. Because our family was probably about the poorest family in the community. We really didn't have much. My sister had felt that one of my sisters that didn't go overseas uh, ended up having four kids and adopting nine more kids to raise. Um, as a young person, she had a, uh, a heart that she would raise, give money back so my folks could build a decent house because we lived in a shell of a place that was that I grew up in. And um, in order to do that, we had a lot of timber on the place and we bought an old sawmill. And out of that, through high school, I was cutting lumber. It took us all my four years of high school to build that house. And all the, <laughs> I would say the machinery was broken down half of the time, <laughs> at least, sometimes more. You spend more time repairing than you would because it was worn, well worn out. And everything we had was usually hand-me-downs people gave us and they were about destroyed. And so I learned to build a house. I learned to 
repair machinery. I learned to, and when we went to Ethiopia, we were in very remote areas and uh, uh, I had to do everything. I ended up getting an old Land Rover. There wasn't any part of that car I did not repair on. And it, it just is, uh, you know, amazing that God prepared me in a physical way sure. for a remote area, sure. as well as, as, as learning to be individualistic and figure out how to do things. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, you were in Ethiopia for 13 years. What, what are some of the, both sides, some of the, the, the victories and, and some of the struggles that you went through during those times? Growing up, I was in a very small community outside of Port Angeles. I had no spiritual fellowship with anybody going through high school. And the little church I had, nobody really had any particular input into me. I was seeking to live for Christ in the school. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have anybody advising me. When I went away to Prairie, I thought I was in heaven. The fellowship, the relationship, all these people around me for four years and you just interacted spiritually, interacted in your vision for the Lord and what he was calling you to and all the things. I mean, it was such a different thing where you had people everywhere. Now I go back to this place of Burji down in southern Ethiopia and I end, I end up with my wife and two other women for years. And I think that one of the biggest struggles was to, to not have someone that I could relate to on a deep level spiritually. Eventually, I was able to find another brother in Ethiopia who, who was really kindred spirit to me. And through the years, we've been really a kind of a soul brother with each other. And that helped me to f find someone that I really related to. And I was looking for it. It took a long time before I found him, this particular brother. But uh, it's one of the things that I think some missionaries going out knew really can struggle with if they don't have the support base certainly, certainly. that you have here. And uh, I struggled. <laughs> Do you still have contact with this brother? Yeah, we, we, we've written back and forth in the last couple oh, of weeks. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, you're in Ethiopia the 13 years, and then where from there? Where else have you served? We had to leave Ethiopia because of the war there. There was fighting. There was Our kids were in a, in a boarding school. There was shooting going across campus. My wife was really struggling with the... The things are going off, there are executions going on, and we just felt, well, we knew it was time, God's time to leave, and we left. We were home for about a year and a half looking at where should we go, and I had looked at different places, but in the end, God uh, led us uh, to Liberia, West Africa. Okay. Uh, I was wanting to get in church planning. When I went, they said, we're not wanting to do that right now. They put me in working in the radio station and working with the radio broadcasters for about a year and a half. In the meantime, I was doing a lot of survey in the country okay. and found a tribe way up in the northern part of, of uh, Liberia that, that uh, was really totally unevangelized among the, the called the Bondi people. And we spent from, we went to Liberia in 79 and then uh, in 81, we moved to up to Colahoun in, in the north and worked there till 89 when a war came. We had to leave. And then uh, once a year, a bit over a year, and year and a half later, things cooled down. Then we went back again for another year, almost a half, before we ended up having to uh, evacuate suddenly. Okay. Okay. You said that group was unevangelized. What do you mean by unevangelized? There were four churches in a tribe of people in up in the, in the northern part among a people group of maybe 65,000 spread over probably three or four hundred square miles and half of it 
animistic half of it, the southern half, Islamic. And I had been already up in that area. I've been told about it. I've been praying about that in two other tribe areas where there were unreached people groups. And when God opened the door, I made a survey trip up there and I just felt God was so much leading in us going up there and, and living there, starting a team and, and uh, reaching out to those people. And that's, that's where I was anchored in then in our last segment in Africa before we ended up coming back to the States in 92. Okay. Well, you, you've been, as you said, back in the States for a while. I know you've been going back and forth. And in recent years, there's this uh, project of these MP3 players. And uh, what, what, what's, the, what's behind the MP3 player? You know, 91, when we went back, the government forces held Monrovia, Liberia, and the rebel forces held the rest of the country. But there was kind of a standoff and a somewhat of a peace agreement that came between them at that stage. Uh, the, the, the government forces had a West African force that was maintaining it, so it made it tough for the rebels to come in because they had a lot of uh, these uh, other West African uh, military there. In 1991, as this peace agreement between the government and the rebel forces that kind of opened up the way, mm -hmm. um, they a allowed people to start flowing back and forth. And uh, I was able to go up and get permission to go on up to back to Colahoon and I made four trips up there with uh, different people in 92, earlier part of 92. And my wife went on one of those trips and some others, but one of the way I got connected in going back to Liberia was one of the pastors, a fellow that I had worked with early on when I first went to Colahoon, uh, had gone on, he had, he had gone on to uh, Monrovia. He was, went through Bible college there and was a radio broadcaster for the Bondi people. And he ended up having to flee in the, about 2000 over to Sierra Leone. Everybody fled from, from the district into Sierra Leone and Guinea. They, they were, people were just murderous. They'd kill anybody that they saw yeah. and robbing and things. So everybody fled. And uh, he made contact with me when he was in Sierra Leone through the Red Cross. And I made a trip to Sierra Leone and Guinea in 10 different refugee camps in 2004. And then I came back uh, later to, to go back again. But this pastor, when I had met him in 92, um, when I uh, met with him, and he's working in a very southern part, very remote area, and my concern is how do these people feed themselves? And I was able to get a cassette player, and I had uh, First and Second Timothy of Scott Gilchrist, uh, pastor of Southwest Bible Church, and, and uh, uh, I gave him a set of tapes and that player for him to be using down where he was. So back in 92, I was already thinking, how can you give these people something that can feed them when they have nothing? They, have, they don't have anyone around them. There's no one that can encourage them. How can you help these people? So when I came back again in 2005, and I was spending time up in the, the going up to Colahoon, each trip I went out, now they had the CD players, and I put together a package of four of these with a solar panel, the rechargeable batteries, and a, a speaker for these four people to be able to uh, have and be teaching. And I would right. give it to key men that I was discipling and working with on each of those trips. And I really felt like these guys need something to feed them. I'm here just for a little time and I'm gone for a year. There's nobody around that they can feed off of. So that is what kind of where it got started. Then the MP3 players came out and the price came down on some models and I was looking at that and I thought, man, I can put a lot of messages on one of those little players. So a couple years I was doing it, but I was having a very poor success rate because a lot of them were failing on me. 
when I was taking him over there. Then in, when I was there in 2010, I had already given out all the players I had. And I had another pastor who had been through university and he was proposing something that was really respecting to demons in one of the meetings. And I took him aside later, I called him and talked with him. And I was thinking, this guy needs something to train him with. I don't have any of these players. And I considered, what do I do? Do I uh, buy them and then sell them to these people? They won't have money. And the excuse everybody will have, I don't have money, I can't buy it. Scott Gilchrist, on the last Sunday before I left on that trip, was starting the book of Second Peter. And I heard his first message. And in that message, he suggested that people re be reading through this book, but why not copy it out? I thought that's such a great idea for me to take, because I was teaching Philippians in Liberia on that strip, and I started having pastors write out Philippians one chapter a day through the week while I'm teaching it. And I had pastors say, I used to, I like this verse, I turned to this verse, and I turned to this verse. Now I know what the context is. I know what it's talking about because they never would just read the book and see it in context. Sure. The tendency of many pastors was just to use a cross-reference, jump from verse to verse to verse, but never read a book through and study it. So I'm thinking about, Scott Gilchrist has had kind of the habit of reading a book 50 times before he even starts to study it, to preach on it. That's too much. <laughs> <laughs> What about 20? And what about if they copy this out? Then we give them a player. Once they fulfill the reading, of, a pastor would fulfill the reading of it and copy it. By that time, they are digging deep into this book. That's good. And it just seems like the Lord, I, I mean, it was the Lord. There's no question about it because it's become such a workable model for these people. It's not too heavy for them to read it the 20 times, but it's also, and it's a big challenge for them to write it out, some of them to write it out. And some will start and they'll stop. Then they'll think, well, I'll go back and yeah. do it. Because just that little MP3 player, which we can deliver there for $25, is <laughs> impacts not only this pastor, but impacts his whole church, because he's now getting into the Word, and it's changing the way these pastors are preaching and teaching. So it's just something, it seemed like out of the desire to give these something, these people something more when I'd leave, because my time with them was so short, and I'd disciple, and I'd talk, and talk, sure. and talk, and then I'm gone for a year. And what do you do with, how do these people feed themselves? And I just think God's put us on the cutting edge of something that can touch the churches around the world, actually. Certainly. So what are you hearing back from these pastors now that are going through this? Where I was going to Kolohun on these trips, I would have somewhere between 15 and 25 leaders that would come in for a training. As the project has started, has been going there, and we have a we have a national coordinator in each country. Okay. And we have, either in Liberia, there are 10 other uh, district right now, 10 district coordinators. We give a, a, a bit of uh, help to the national coordinator and we cover the costs of these other ones with the project. There's over 300 in that upper district, Colohoun and the other two towns that are, have been, are into this project in many different denominations. And the, the relationship even that's coming between the denominations where these guys are coming together for the training, for fellowship, and for prayer together is, I, when I was talking with our, our, our uh, uh, 
national coordinator. And I asked him, what is the effect of this in relationship to the denominations? Sorry. He said, he, he just lit up, you know, you could hear him on the, I'm working with Skype, and he just lit up uh, uh, in his conversation and said, oh, it's so exciting. You know, I, I just see how that they're, it's drawing them all together so that our purpose isn't conflicting with one another, but our purpose is getting the gospel out to people. And I think that's a, that's a side effect Certainly. of our intention, but it's Good definitely, <laughs> definitely it's, it's, it's a powerful thing and it's happening Certainly. many, many places. And then I have many people who say, you know, I now see the value of really studying a book. And, and I, I really understand now what the what Romans is talking about it's so it it really shows me our God, our salvation and what it's about and I'm now teaching it in my church and I have many of my people in my church reading and rereading through Romans which nobody ever read through a book of the Bible they just never did it and now these pastors and Bible teachers Sunday school teachers are involved with this it's really making an impact in, in what God's doing among those people. You said there were 300 pastors in the one and area. Pastors and teachers. It, it, pastors and teachers in the one area that have read Romans 20 times, have written it out, and have been listening to these sermons. And one of the conferences, it was one of the denominations came together, and our coordinator there was over, went over to the, it's another town, and uh, he said he just got so many he said it was such a celebration of all these men coming together and talking about Romans and telling testimonies of what God was doing in their lives that it's hard for us to get those testimonies here from that district. Though we have a whole list of them that have come from Uganda where we're just launching the project. And uh, I think about 30 different people and some say it's, it's just opening this book to me. So I read it 20 times. They're, you know, they're excited about it. Sure. And each one is giving their own particular thing of what God's doing in their life as a result of this Romans project. Mm -hmm. And and Rick Kallenberg, who's our, inter, our overseas coordinator, just told me today that in Uganda, they have three conferences scheduled uh, either May, June, he's gonna be over there. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want a hundred, we expecting a hundred pastors and leaders in each of those conferences. And we're just starting there. So it's, brother, <laughs> it's expanding. Stuff, expanding. It's blowing up. Exponentially. Out. And we're, now we're already going to Uganda. And what we haven't talked about is from Liberia and there's Sierra Leone and there's Ghana and there's Nigeria and there's several other countries. How many, how many would you say right now have been involved, how many pastors and teachers are involved in this project that either have or in the process of reading Romans 20 times and writing it out? We are right now short of players and we've bought our 5,000th, 5th, 1,000th lot of players. We have some that are on in transit right now to Liberia, but the people are already in process. And, and we have 300 that are going this week out to Sierra Leone, 320. We have 198 going on to Liberia this week. Rick Kallenberg in his East Africa trip has taken 560 going there. Th uh, three course, three trainings in Uganda, likely one in Ethiopia and another one in Kenya. So we're just starting to see what we can do in that Eastern block of countries. We also have a, a small group up in, in Guinea that are English speaking, it's French country, but there's some English speaking pastors there and there's a group that are starting the project. Uh, we're thinking of, well, we're thinking a lot more things about this, but um, we're looking at other languages of putting Scott's messages uh, on Romans and First and Second Timothy, which would be 175 messages into Amharic, the, the language of Ethiopia. There are 25,000 evangelical churches there. There are 20 million believers. I mean, that's just one country. 
if we do that, we're, we're thinking that we really see the need of French. And he just had a, Rick Kallenberg just had a, a request to bring it to Congo. Well, that's French. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't do anything now. Uh, we have requests coming from Latin America into Spanish. So that's knocking on our door <laughs> that we, we move into Certainly. other languages as well with this. Certainly. And, and so what I'm hearing is the, the 5,000 that are involved in it right now, you, I hear you saying we haven't even scratched the surface. We, we, I'm, I'm needing to send 450 more to Nigeria. I would have sent out this week another 100 to Liberia if I'd had them. We are already needing our 6,000th and we need it right away. So why, what's holding you back? Well, right now, we don't have the funds. Okay. That's, that's bottom line. I'd like to give a statistic that was done. They quoted that there are 2.25 million churches in the world. 85% of those pastors have had no theological training. As we focus on Africa, it might not do a big dent in the worldwide need, but it would be so impacting throughout Africa for people to get into reading the scripture, Romans, 20 times, copying it out. That book becomes alive to them. I don't care, even if they're not very well trained, I have people coming back and saying, that just really impacted me. And then I had one of the men who said, I was really struggling in getting the book, but when I started listening to Scott Gilchrist on, on the MP3 player, I just, I listened through and I listened through and I listened through because I really wanted to get it. And for some, I had said, the MP3 player wasn't so important to me, but I learned a new principle of getting into the Word. And I think the reading and the copying, he says, that will change the way I do things. And he's working on his master's degree right now in Liberia as a, a very educated person. And he felt like just the project, but what was the motivation? That little MP3 player. And I mean, they're so small and yet so valuable to, to uh, what the people need. So they're reading the word, they're writing the word, and then they're hearing the, the model of the preached word to them and, and then using this as a model with their churches. There's another step that we have in this that uh, our Rick Kellenberg is involved with a lot of. And we've set up one day, six, seven hour conferences. And pastors who are involved in this, when he's been there, are come together for this training on, on how to study the Bible, on preaching expositorily, and how to use this MP3 both in their study and in their sermon preparation. And that has been so well received. And our national directors, Nigeria's in May, they got several conferences coming in May in Nigeria. And they are teaching that training. They've been through the training with Rick and worked with him, and now they're doing it. Momo in Liberia has held, I don't know how many of these conferences they set up in different districts. And the people say, we want more, we want more. <laughs> these pastors coming together that are reading and doing this. And we need more of this training. So it's not just Rick that's involved with it, but this whole training program that's going on in how to study the Bible, how to preach the truth of the word, and how to use this the, the MP3. Now on that MP3, we have 125 messages of Scott Gilchrist on Romans, and 50 and uh, a total of over 800 messages on other books of the Bible. Five, 499, I think it is, hours of listening. Uh, audio library, uh, virtual you know, seminary there. <laughs> frankly, it is. With these MP3 players, as we look at it with a person going through reading, 
20 times, and if they would continue on with the project, which we really encourage them to do in these training courses and other follow-up that our, our coordinators are doing, they're encouraging people to go on with this project. If a person would read each book 20 times, copy it out, and listen through Scott, whose detail goes through expounding this and applying the truths of each of these books, I'm convinced that a person doing that will get far more Bible knowledge that he can use in training his people than if he went to Bible college. I believe it with all my heart. It's, it's meeting a gap across Africa. It can meet a gap across the world for these untrained, we were talking about 85% of the 2.2 million, which is far higher than that now, that need it. And just think of the impact of 100,000 of these players could impact 20, 40, 50 million people in their churches, just 100,000 of them. <laughs> Think of the potential God's put before us. I'm amazed. And God just seemed like he dropped it in our lap. And I think it's our responsibility to run with him, in step with him, yoke together with him, but just keeping in step, and he's doing it. Mm. Immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. <laughs> it's beyond what I ever imagined. <laughs> amen, amen. Well, John, hey, Thank you so much for just sharing these exciting things of what, what God is doing now, what God has done in preparing you um, all these years. And just thank you for being here. And just uh, may the Lord continue to richly bless, bless you, my friend. Well, thank you. I so much uh, appreciate the opportunity. And I appreciate the, the team that God's put together for doing this. And I've just seen... God bring in key men and Rick Kallenberg is so key in this whole process of a man who was wanting to move out of being working here in the States, getting back to Africa, training pastors and this has opened a, a door, a wide open door for him, far beyond anything he imagined and he is so much in tune with it and I feel like God's just putting all these pieces and then he makes so many contacts and other people are all being pulled together. And I just believe that God's, God's doing something he is. tremendous to meet the need of his church in Africa. And I believe it's gonna be far beyond Africa eventually. And uh, thank you so much for just being a part of what we're doing and involved with this whole project yourself. So Lord bless you.